Nicola, many congratulations on the publication of your new book, uh, Crown of Blood, subtitled The Deadly Inheritance of Lady Jane Grey. In it, you argue that the Crown of England was in some ways a poison chalice. I think that the term poison chalice is perhaps a bit strong, but I do certainly argue that royal blood could be as much of a curse as a blessing. And I think really that Jane's example demonstrates that for any who aspired to a crown, the axe could fall at any time. In what ways was Lady Jane Grey a pawn on a political chessboard? She was absolutely 100% a pawn. She was, the traditional tale that Jane was forced into a queenship that she didn't want is 100% accurate. Um, she in no way wanted to be queen. And for a long time, I don't think that her parents ever imagined that she would be queen either, or certainly not a queen regnant in her own right. I think that they had visions of her marrying Edward VI and becoming a queen consort, but never queen in her own right, which was completely unprecedented at that time in any case. So the whole situation was really manipulated prim primarily by um, John Dudley, the Duke of Northumberland, and Jane's parents eventually fell in with it too. And of course, Jane, being a girl, was expected to fall in with the wishes of her parents and her male superiors, and just expected to be obedient. How significant was John Dudley in this tragic drama? Incredibly significant. Um, John Dudley really rises um, to power during the reign of Edward VI, and comes to the forefront of English politics through the fall of Edward VI's uncle, um, Edward Seymour, the Duke of Somerset. And he really manipulated the whole situation in order to serve his own purposes and to keep a grasp on the power that he had over the throne. What do you think it is about the Tudors that centuries later has created such high drama for historians to investigate? They're such a cutthroat family and such a cutthroat dynasty, I think. And um, they've all got such strong personalities, or most of them have anyway. So um, you've got Henry VIII, who's this larger-than-life figure, the, almost in many ways the father of the Tudor dynasty. And, um, of course, Elizabeth I is, is well-remembered um, too. But actually, Edward and Mary, Henry's son and Henry's other daughter, they were... Um, they were dominant personalities within their own right. It's just that their, um, their reigns and their lives were cut short and they didn't have much chance to demonstrate their characters. But we have to remember that within the five years that Mary was queen, she did order the burnings of nearly 300 Protestants. And I think had Edward VI reigned longer too, then he probably would have done something similar in terms of Catholics. It was an age of extremes, wasn't it? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely extremes. And, um, you know, some historians estimate that Henry VIII ordered the executions of up to 72,000 people, which is almost certainly a gross exaggeration. But needless to say, by the end of his reign, he had gone from a handsome and liberal um, prince to a tyrant. So what's next for you? So my next book is a biography of Latisse Knowles, who was the wife of Elizabeth I's favourite, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester. So it's called Elizabeth's Rival, The Life of Latisse Knowles. Um, but that, again, is interesting too, because she may have been an illegitimate granddaughter of Henry VIII's, and so they may have, she already was a cousin of Elizabeth I, but actually the two might have been closer than they maybe you know, were aware of themselves. And she died at the age of 91, so her reign, um, sorry, her life spans from the reign of Henry VIII right through to Charles I. Nicola Tallis, thank you. Thank you.